Hindul Sen Gupta. I'm absolutely thrilled to have Air Marshal retired G.S. Bedi with me on this program today. The Air Marshal really understands some of the most pivotal things we are talking about today. India's military preparedness, and not just India's military preparedness, but India's military preparedness in the skies. I'm going to talk to him about a wide range of issues, beginning with the U India-US defense ties, going on to, you know, what kind of jet engines do, does India really need? Who's going to give it to India? Will the HAL-GE program really work? And many other things. Air Marshal, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Singh Gupta. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. I want to begin, sir, uh, by talking to you a little bit about how you see India-US defense ties. Because, you know, we've been talking about this for a couple of weeks now. There's a lot of interest there. Some people believe that we're at a pivot in these ties. Uh, you know, the Honorable Prime Minister said that uh, some of the hesitations of the past have to be left behind as we go forward. Some people believe that, well, we've seen this. We've seen in this entire thing before. Uh, the civil nuclear deal, you know, there was so much enthusiasm about it. That didn't really go anywhere. Uh, I had a conversation with the Masa Nirupama Menon Rao. She said, well, actually, many lessons had been learned from that, uh, from the civil nuclear deal not really going far. Where do you stand in this argument and why? Thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, Hindol, if I may call you that. The yes. Uh, you know, j just a brief, I'll take 30 seconds. You know, I'm not a very known public figure. So I think your audience must know why should they be listening to me. I'll just take 30 seconds to introduce myself. You know, I joined the Indian Air Force way back in 1984 uh, as a fighter pilot. I've flown MiG-21s and Mirage 2000 extensively. Uh, I commanded a fighter squadron and a fighter base. Then I led a UN uh, contingent to Congo. I took part in Kargil mission where I flew 25 live missions uh, from Shirinagar, was awarded uh, Vayusena Medal Gallantry for that. Uh, I have been air attaché in London for three years and I have looked after air operations uh, in three commands, you know, Western Air Command, Southern Air Command and Eastern Air Command and also have been uh, in charge of the entire JNK as AFC JNK and in air headquarter, I looked after the offensive operations and uh, at the culmination of my career, uh, I was director general inspection and safety where we were looking after the entire health of the Air Force. You know, inspection branch is something which uh, goes around and uh, uh, briefs or rather debriefs the chief of air staff directly as to where does today's Air Force stand. You know, it's a very thorough inspection uh, which is carried out. So I think uh, with that, uh, you know, I shall be in a position to tell you exactly uh, about the Air Force. I just retired a year ago. So I'm um, recently, you know, sort of uh, current on the issues. Okay. Uh, coming to your Thoughtful, point. Sir, uh, that really gives our audience a perspective about your vast knowledge across many terrains oh, and many departments. Thank you yeah, for that. I thought it was important, to, you know, to, for someone to uh, know that uh, why should they be listening to me. Right. And, and of course, the authenticity of the argument that I make. Now, uh, what happens is you uh, talked about this deal. When uh, this deal, uh, everyone has called it a landmark deal. Okay, I personally feel uh, it to be so. Firstly, you would have noticed one peculiar thing about this uh, visit. I would say, let's we'll come to the deal uh, per se. This visit, I have never seen a visit so much being talked about. Okay, it was talked about before the visit, during the visit, after the visit, we are still talking about it, right? Now, how does that make a difference? You know, when there is so much of talk each and every minute is being monitored, I think it helps people understanding what's going on. Uh, it makes the players, uh, you know, accountable because there is transparency. Because every minute is being monitored, there is a lot of transparency. So that makes the uh, people accountable that as to whatever, whatever was said, whatever was talked about, uh, what is happening on that. Now, people's apprehensions are genuine. So, nuclear deal you talked about, I mean, we haven't yet uh, probably uh, bought a single civil uh, nuclear reactor. DTTI, you know, Defense uh, Technology Trade Initiative was launched way back in 2012. I think in 2019, it got called off. And even in that, you know, this technology was to come. Indian technology was to come GE. And GE has been with us, you know, LC has been flying with the FGE engines 404 uh, for quite some time now. 
So what is different uh, this time? I think what is different this time is that uh, earlier, while, you know, the deal was within government to government, like, you know, it was a government assurance to the government, whereas the private company like GE uh, would be accountable or would be responsible to its shareholders. You know, it, it is a profit making company. So they will have those considerations overbearing probably that what technology they want to give, what they don't want to give. So when it came to hot section technology or certain uh, crucial technology where they found that their business interests may be at jeopardy because we were also at a different level in technology. But now the difference is that this is the deal between GE and HEL. So I'm sure they would have gone through all those aspects that what is beneficial for them. They have taken their uh, major uh, people into confidence and reached a conclusion that probably they can go ahead and uh, transfer this uh, technology. What comes, uh, actually time will tell, but we can only uh, make a reasonable educated guess that what is different this time. So uh, Prime of AC, this is different as uh, uh, I see from the last uh, deals that it is a directly uh, direct agreement between two uh, entities. Now, overall, what comes out of defense deal, you know, a lot of uh, uh, headlines have been uh, taken by uh, this jet engine and the Reaper, uh, you know, the MQ-9. They will obviously give us a great uh, capability. You know, if you come to the Reaper uh, capability, uh, sustained surveillance, it can fly for 30 hours plus at a time, has got... Uh, great sensors, etc. We can talk about it a little later in detail um, if if the time permits. So uh, we have been falling short of a little uh, sensor capability. You know, you come to Cargill, everywhere it has been uh, flashed that we fell short on our uh, ISR, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Even till as late as Chinese incursions, you know, there is a there are murmurs in the media that we could not really detect it in uh, time. So this will provide a great uh, capability. Other than these two deals, you know, jet engine and uh, these reapers, there are uh, there are a lot of other under, uh, not so well spoken about uh, uh, agreements, you know, like space agreement, you know, NASA and ISRO uh, agreement, they have agreed to uh, launch NISAR, you know, which is NASA, uh, ISRO, uh, SAR, Synthetic Aperture Radar Satellite which will boost our capability to a great deal. They have agreed to help us in our Gaganyaan mission. They will put an Indian uh, astronaut on ISS International Space Station very soon. And then uh, there is another critical aspect of, uh, you know, critical minerals uh, uh, agreement, you know, where, where we will have access to those critical uh, minerals like lithium, cobalt, etc. which, and where are they used? They're used in making batteries, you know, uh, and how will batteries help the Indian Air Force? They will help in drones. You know, all drones now, quick reaction drones, you know, they don't start on engines, they start on batteries. And we are a little short uh, on that uh, capability. So if we get that capability, our drone industry uh, will come up. And then artificial intelligence and quantum technology, all this is going to help because uh, when you say that Reaper can stay in the air for 30 hours, what is it going to do for 30 hours? It's going to give you so much of data, so much of data that if you do not have, uh, you know, very uh, high end technology or high power computing available, you will not be able to analyze that data. You're not going to have people sitting on the desk uh, and analyzing that data that which bend or which culvert or which, uh, co you know, concentration has come up or what has changed in a particular air field, et cetera, et cetera. You know, people will look for the obvious, you know, like I have been trained to look for certain things uh, over a period of time. So now I, I, I will be biased in my mind to only look for that and develop that, you know, you don't look for the uh, unobvious. So these engines like AI, which look, which have the capability to look at vast data, so what I'm uh, saying is that real capability of your these drones, which we are buying, you know, et cetera, will be realized only if these support systems also come up. So it will be equally important that those aspects are uh, built up. So overall, when I see, I think this will make a, a great change. And then political commitment, I guess I, uh, uh, I on the face of it, it seems uh, uh, a, a lot of degrees higher than we have been having probably in the past, 
So if that is a commitment that, okay, this technology has to come, a lot of push and atam nirbar, et cetera, et cetera. So these are few uh, indicators which might make this particular defense deal different from what we have been uh, seeing earlier. You know, it's not necessary that everything that happens now will follow the footprints of the past. Obviously, things change. And uh, I feel personally uh, that things will change. So I personally am on that side who's optimistic that uh, things will come up uh, for the Indian Air Force, especially. Therefore, Amash, take us through a little bit on your understanding of India's air preparedness. You mentioned that in many cases in the past, right up to the Chinese incursions, we have in some areas fallen short. Take us through your broad understanding of our preparedness, where we are falling short, and what kind of sustenance we need in those areas where this deal could help. Also, what about the Rafael deal? Many people are asking, what happened to that? You know, that was going to give us a great deal of support too. Uh, what's your understanding of what's happening there? See, uh, if you talk of capability of uh, Air Force, I mean, you know, we have been at it uh, for quite some time. Now, uh, I think our major problem earlier has been that uh, not only Indian Air Force, India as a defense forces, we have been uh, for quite some time only West centric, you know, our everything revolved around like we when we were uh, young uh, people, uh, everything was Pakistan centric. Everything was West centric. You know, what is Pakistan has got F-16, what do we have? You know, that if they have got this particular air defense system, what do we have? China somehow was always in the background. You know, it was considered peaceful rise of China. You know, it is uh, just taking place something. We never paid much attention. So our capability building initially was uh, more of West centric and we were very happy with that. It's only when China has come into, uh, you know, the game. Incidentally, not that we didn't have short falls. Like I just said, Cargill, we were quite surprised. I mean, Cargill committee report is very, very uh, critical of the intelligence gaps, you know, which were there. And that is why we immediately picked up, you know, post Cargill, these uh, Herons and searchers, UAVs, you know, to boost our uh, intelligence capability. Now, those deals, they, they were good for those times, but they are not good anymore because they're capability, their look angles, their sensors, etc., will not uh, serve the purpose. Their line of sight, you know, they don't even have some of them uh, SATCOM connection. So the range uh, suffers, you know, etc., etc. But now uh, when we have started looking at little broader uh, aspect, then uh, obviously Indian Air Force has uh, gone great leaps. You know, the kind of capability that we have built up, uh, no, uh, I mean, not that there are no shortfalls, we'll come to that. Now, if you talk of uh, aircraft strength, you know, there is a lot of talk every time uh, they, we say we need a uh, established strength of 42 squadrons. You know, we are at about 30. Uh, squadrons out of that three are MiG-21 Bison squadrons. They are not, uh, they are not any less. But what happens is technologically, obviously, they are little older than uh, the current uh, generation. We have Rafale, you know, squadrons, two squadrons strategically uh, positioned. We have LCAs uh, coming up. We already have. Uh, you know, a decent number of that. Uh, Mark IIs will be coming up. Mark IIAs are under uh, production, okay? Then we have Mirage 2003 squadrons. We have about 12 Su-30 squadrons, okay? We have five Jaguar squadrons. We have three MiG-29 squadrons, etc. So they are all upgraded. MiG-29 is upgraded, okay? The Jaguars is uh, uh, upgraded and is getting upgraded to even a, a better version. So technologically, if you see, we uh, aircraft-wise, whatever aircraft we have are, are uh, very good and they are as modern as any modern air force can have. Along with that, we have upgraded our air defense systems. You know, we have inducted S-400, we have ballistic missile defense program. Uh, we have chain of radars, you know, starting from... Uh, low level lightweight radars to medium power radars to high power radars to uh, radars which can you know cover large areas we have inducted AVACs, we have inducted air to air refuelers though not large in numbers i mean their number uh, definitely requires to be uh, built up and we are working on uh, you know these long range vectors you know brahmos is a great capability we have ground launched uh, brahmos since long and we have developed now air launched uh, brahmos the weapons which have come with Rafale, you know, scalp missile, 540 kilometers range and very, very accurate. 
uh, it can go and uh, uh, strike uh, deep into the uh, enemy territory. So uh, there is a lot of capability uh, which has come up and above all uh, is the net centric operations. You see, like we're talking of Brahmos. Now, Brahmos uh, is a great uh, capability. You know, we have two kinds of warheads uh, uh, available with that, you know, and GPS and uh, uh, the radar uh, controlled, you know, that uh, uh, individual, uh, the missile capability, you know, is very, very good. And uh, incidentally, it's the only uh, supersonic cruise missile in the world. You know, uh, generally you have cruise missiles like Tomahawk, etc., which are subsonic. You know, this is a combination of, you know, rocket assisted, rocket launched and subsequently ramjet takes over, which uh, gives it a supersonic capability. So it almost touches Mark 3, you know, Mark 2.8 and strikes the target at uh, Mark 2 plus, you know, which gives it great penetration uh, capability. And we have increased the range. Initially, there was there were constraints of the range of 290 kilometers because of MTCR, uh, etc. Now, which uh, can go beyond and now. The most important, we have air launched version of that, you know, on Su-30. Now, Su-30 can go to any range and launch it from there. Even its uh, uh, range, air launched range will uh, increase. That is one. And along with that, like, you know, S-400, uh, air defense uh, missile, anti-ballistic missile and uh, uh, other surface to surface missiles, uh, our uh, various classes, you know, we have uh, Nirbhay uh, cruise missile, then Pralai, we, we heard in the news, you know, it's a, a tactical SRBM, short range ballistic missile, about 500 kilometers of range, which needs to be uh, developed. So I think uh, if you will see, then people compare it with uh, China, let's say. China has a long uh, and large inventory of these missiles, you know, DF. 15 and DF-21, which we uh, we are not talking of nuclear uh, arsenal, okay? Uh, standard missiles, which can be used against our uh, targets. They, they have large inventory, but what happens is the long-range missiles, which are ballistic in nature, that is, they escape the atmosphere, go to outer space and come back. They always have a problem with accuracy because uh, inertial nav... Uh, they do drift away, then uh, you improve their accuracy by ring laser, gyros, etc. Uh, but still a lot uh, needs to be uh, desired uh, in, in terms of accuracy. And, you know, which comes with uh, terminal seekers, you know, like which cruise missiles can uh, employ, like your, you know, uh, MMW seek millimetric weight seekers or uh, IR kind of seekers, thermal seekers, etc., etc. Okay, they're different uh, technologies. So that is, I think, where we need to uh, build up as far as uh, missiles are concerned. And uh, as far as like air vectors, we were talking of, you know, we've seen the number of types of aircraft, the arsenal, which they can carry. Rafale is a great uh, uh, boost uh, in that. And long range uh, missiles, it has got, no, what happens is along with a weapon is not the only criterion uh, with an aircraft. It's a survivability in the contested airspace, how long it can hold itself is of very, very vital importance. So the kind of electronic suites that it comes with, you know, spectra suite and uh, other uh, electronic countermeasures or the radar capability, ability to be together with each other, you know, what kind of situational awareness it creates. These are some intangibles, you know, which cannot be uh, put on paper uh, for general uh, public consumption. You know, uh, one would... Uh, translate capability of an aircraft, how fast it can fly, how far it can go, and what kind of weapon uh, it can launch, okay? Like Meteor Missile, for example, it comes with that great capability uh, in air-to-air -air, uh, domain because it's it provides you a longer arm. You know, if you compare two boxers, if a boxer has a longer arm, then he has an advantage uh, over the uh, other one. So like this, uh, all these capabilities, uh, you know, are, uh, uh, they have come together. And the most important uh, aspect which Air Force has taken great care in is in uh, net-centric operations. Now we have counted all the sensors, you know, you talk of aircraft, you talk of air defense missiles, you talk of, you know, surface-to-air missiles. You talk of radars. Radars are not only with the Air Force. Army has so many radars. Navy has so many radars. 
and our civil aviation has so many radars. Now, every uh, asset or every radar is, after all, a national asset. The kind of inputs they are going to give you, you have to be able to utilize those uh, inputs. Take a case, you know, uh, radars have overlapping uh, domain. Like, you know, one radar looks at certain area, then there are no gaps. The second radar looks a bit of common area, like, you know, there are overlaps. So if a target is painted by two radars or more than one radar, it may cause confusion uh, with the person, you know, that which radar, I mean, are there two people or the same guy is being picked up by uh, two radars. So these anomalies are resolved by net centric uh, operations. So there is a very fine integrated air command and control system, IACCS, what we call. You know, the capability is that sitting in Bangalore, I can control an aircraft over Srinagar. You know, so that is the kind of seamless integration and we have done uh, exercises, you know, of that uh, nature that where you can, uh, it is, you are no more dependent on that, you know, uh, this particular sector is not available to me or, you know, communications in this sector have gone up. So you are not, no sector is now uh, standalone. You know, they're all so well uh, integrated which is only possible, uh, you know, with the uh, great initiatives uh, into net centric or continuous upgradation uh, of uh, technology. And uh, yeah, one more aspect I'll, and the capability, you know, which is very important is the training aspect. You know, what we keep saying, man behind the machine, okay? Indian Air Force takes great care in training its people to very hard standards. You know, we have one, some of the finest institutes like TACD or, you know, tactics uh, and combat uh, uh, development establishment, okay? And which trains its people. So it, it's like Top Gun school, you know, equivalent of that. So that hard is the training and we do so many international air exercises. You know, there's not a country, I think, you know, which is ready to do exercise with us and we have not done with. We started with US, but now every, most of the Europe and even Australia and South Africa and you name a country, we have done exercises with them. One is coming up shortly in October, November. It's already in the news, Tarang uh, Shakti, where I believe 12 nations are going to participate. So this is when, this is a broader view of the Indian Air Force uh, preparation. So to a little bit about even though for common people, even though you've given us a broad detail about how well prepared Indian Air Forces are, in common knowledge, this idea that the planes keep crashing, trained young pilots keep dying, seems to keep coming up. Where is the gap in understanding them? Uh, see, what happens is uh, earlier, probably if you see statistics, uh, you know, Air Force always works for zero accident rate, you know, which may not be achievable, but it is desirable. No, no accident is warranted and nobody crashes an aeroplane, you know, uh, knowingly or intentionally. Also, every aeroplane that gets airborne or gets into the sky is airworthy. You know, and I now what has happened is there is more transparency. You know, the social media has come up. The reporting has become very extensive and it makes a great impact. You know, when an aircraft crashes as compared to uh, a road accident, because the quantum is uh, very, very high. We are not saying that they are comparable to road accidents, not at all. I mean, they, they translate uh, national security. But what happens is the narrative that, you know, aircraft are old and they are, they keep crashing and as if people are being launched into unserviceable aircraft is something which needs to be eradicated from people's mind. Now, I, and I, why I say that, you take a case today, uh, people read newspapers, you know, any anomaly or any uh, misgiving, even serving people or more so retired, etc., people rush to court. Right. That, you know, somebody uh, nowadays, even if it doesn't get, a, a, you know, some aspect or some human resource uh, aspect addressed adequately, you know, we read in papers, you know, somebody, let's say, is not uh, rightly promoted or somebody does not go to a place of his choice, etc. I mean, you Google it or you don't know, uh, through RTI, it will be available that how many people go to court to say that this is not being done right. Okay. I'm certain that if Air Force was to launch its pilots in an 
you know, unserviceable or wrong aircraft, there will be so much hue and cry, not emotionally, but uh, but uh, formally. You know, there is a difference between just emotionally saying that, oh, wrong is happening, wrong is happening, but with evidence, I mean to say, somebody would have projected it with evidence that, listen, this aircraft was not airworthy and, you know, I was sent into aircraft or my superior forced me that, no, this aircraft is not okay, but please go up in there, it is required. I mean, who does it? It has never done it. The only difference is what we are coming to is the gaps or uh, the shortcomings, what you see at times, at times, uh, the every situation may not be simulated on ground, cannot be practiced, and these aircraft are little unforgiving. In civil aircraft, what happens is, uh, they say when Airbus makes an aircraft or a Boeing makes an aircraft, they make them idiot proof. You know what is this slang, idiot proof? Means you can't make a mistake in that. Okay, it tells you it, uh, you know, because you're carrying passengers, etc. But still, uh, mishaps happen in civil aircraft also. You know, people have landed up with undercarriage up. There are, uh, if you Google civil uh, crashes, I mean, uh, you know, uh, a Pakistan crash recently over Karachi residential area that uh, pilot forgot to lower undercarriage. In, in a aircraft which will shout its lungs out that there is something wrong with the uh, aircraft. Okay, that is uh, attention diversion for some other reason. But in military aircraft, uh, so much of safeties, uh, uh, you know, uh, enough safeties are built in, okay, but not, they they are not idiot proof, okay, they, there are certain uh, aspects, which, you know, take you by surprise, if that situation was not practiced, or suddenly came unseen, or etc. So the error of margin, or margin of error, is very, very small in uh, military flying. So what happens is at times uh, when those situations come up suddenly, you know, uh, a bad weather, in isolation, every situation can be handled. We don't know how many of those situations culminated in safe landings after all. I mean, you know, we are uh, accident rate when we say is one accident against 10,000 hours of flying. Okay. So now if that be the case, then, you know, the number of uh, accidents uh, uh, which we are looking at at the rate or uh, something like that is, uh, is very less number of aircraft uh, crashing. You know, safety record uh, as compared to the other air force is not uh, very bad. But yes, we uh, initially, you know, did not induct so many simulators because we thought that they were not, uh, you know, that important. But now every aircraft that we induct comes with a simulator. I mean, it's a part of the deal. So that has made a lot of difference and will make difference because the simulators uh, uh, teach you a lot. You know, they uh, let you practice those situations which can't be practiced in uh, live aircraft. So that is how things will change uh, for the better, I guess. Uh, I want to ask you, sir, tell us, we were talking in detail about the you know wide array of missiles and cutting edge missile technology that India has. Uh, in some cases, India is only maybe a handful of countries, three, four countries, which have those kind of uh, missiles. If we are so good at this technology. If we are able to send, you know, the cheapest uh, space mission to Mars, why is it that we cannot develop jet engines that we need? And therefore, why is this continuing conversation about how much technology transfer we'll get from the US in this GE deal to get the jet engines that we really need for us to become, you know, in a sense, technology independent or at least not dependent on somebody else? Very good question. And all you see, a lot of people uh, have this misgiving or somebody may not simply give it a thought. Okay, that we we have cryogenic uh, engine technology. We, like you said, can launch satellites now. Okay, we can send uh, missions to Mars. We are uh, thinking of Gaganyaan mission, which is uh, maybe another 10, 15 days. You will see uh, 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 the Chandrayaan mission, I mean. Okay, and uh, Gaganyaan is due subsequently where we will send humans to space. So what is so great about engine uh, technology? You know, why a simple jet engine can't be made? Now, it's very important to understand the difference between these rockets and uh, jet engine. Now, rockets, you know, rocket science is a metaphor to say something which is very difficult. You know, so if you have mastered rocket science, then why not jet engine? Now, the difference is 
that rockets, you know, when it comes to propulsion in rockets, it is probably relatively simpler because there is fuel packed in, you know, solid fuel or liquid fuel, depending on the configuration. It starts and it just burns. You know, it, it just goes. There is no control over solid fuel. Liquid fuel to some extent can be throttled. And now, uh, because it could not be controlled, you develop different stages, you know, stage one, stage two, so that at least you could control uh, that. But the fact is, once it's set on fire, it just develops its thrust and carries on. And for how long does it work? Each stage, if it's a multi-stage, it will work for two minutes. I mean, eight minutes is the total launch time of a rocket when a satellite is put into space. You know, it it uh, uh, in the thicker atmosphere, you know, it, it starts with about two kilometers a second, builds up to about eight to nine kilometers a second. So even if it has to go to 200, 300 or 500 kilometers, it is very less time that we are talking about. Okay. Also, the uh, problems like heat, you know, every time when something moves fast, it develops a lot of heat. So the heat that is generated on the skin of the rocket or, you know, when especially in re-entry, you know, when a missile re-enters the atmosphere, it heats up to a large extent. But what happens is all those phenomena take place momentarily. You know that do you have to understand the time dimension into it now. When that thing happens momentarily, let's say the temperature rises to 3000 degrees Celsius, okay, but happens for a few seconds. I can have a coating of a material like, you know, thermal protection system or ablative materials which absorb all that heat and can disintegrate. So my internal skin is still in contact. And when it enters lower atmosphere, it is there for me to, uh, it's a sustainable. On the other hand, a jet engine, has, does not operate for two minutes or eight minutes. You know, it operates for hours together in a single flight and about thousands of hours for its entire uh, life cycle. When a jet engine sustains temperature of 2000 degrees Celsius in its combustion chamber, it's for a long period of time. The difference is, a, a, you know, if I can draw an analogy, you have seen kids uh, demonstrating uh, lighting a matchstick, putting in the mouth, closing it, okay, because that light extinguishes within no time. Now, ask that kid to do this with mouth open. You can't do that, okay. You've also seen those uh, saints, you know, with the uh, showing mystic power, those babas walking on coal, okay. So what he does is he, you know, on that coal, tuck, 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 he walks because each touch on the coal is is less than a second or a, a few uh, milliseconds. You ask him to stand there for five seconds, he will burn. Okay, that is the difference, uh, you know, between the when I say to time that exposure to time in a jet engine is much much more. Plus, the in rocket science what we are talking of, it is not the main skin which is taking the load. You know, it is a protection system which protects it. But in jet engine, you need a material which takes the load itself. You know, it is, there is no protective system over turbine blades. There is no protective system over combustor system. That, that material itself has to take the load. And the most important part in rockets, what we talk of, there are no rotating parts. In a jet engine, the parts are rotating. And rotating at what speed? Your compressor rotates almost at 10,000 RPM plus. I mean, I'm saying a figurative uh, uh, you know, a, a representative figure, engine to engine, it will vary. And your turbine, you know, turbine rotates almost 15 to 16,000 RPM. 16,000 RPM, when you say, I mean, you see, it's almost 250 rotations per second. Can you imagine the speed at which it is rotating? And when a thing rotates, it develops a lot of loads. You know, there are stresses created on all axis. You know, the blades will, the uh, blade can't be very heavy. It has to be very fine. At the same time, it must withstand all these tensile loads, the you know uh, centrifugal forces, the works, and withstand those uh, high temperatures. So the metallurgy involved in a jet engine is a totally different game. We have our program. You know, it started in '86 with the LCA when LCA was conceived. So GTRE are. Uh, gas turbine research establishment of DRDO, they were given the task and 89, they, you know, production started. In fact, by 2004, they had made nine engines. 
uh, but they were taken to Moscow for testing. They failed. And then LCA was getting too far behind. And I think in about 2008, we put it on back burner. So we lost a lot of time. And now we have an engine which is reached at about 75 kilonewton thrust. Just to tell you, an average engine like what we are flying in the uh, LCA as of now is 90 plus kilonewtons. And this 414, the much talked about uh, G engine, which will come is at 98 kilonewtons. When we come to advanced engines, they go up to 180 kilonewtons uh, also. Okay, But aim is to make an engine about 110 kilonewtons, which should be good uh, for a twin engine uh, aircraft. So currently from the LCA requirement, we are about 10 to 12 kilometer, uh, kilonewtons short. But now it's not linear progression. You know, it is a very steep curve with the, uh, each uh, increment. You know, it is uh, you uh, run 100 meters in probably 12 seconds to get it to 11 seconds and 10 seconds and then to 9.9 .9 and 9.89. It's like that. You know, the kind of effort which is uh, uh, required for that is, is that kind of effort which is required to increase uh, this uh, uh, thrust. So this G deal, uh, what we are talking of, why I am hopeful or I am, uh, you know, uh, uh, what should I say, excited about it is that it should help build us our Kaveri engine also. Like it is not that we are only going to produce 414s in India, you know, uh, jointly. The technology has to come in. Means I must have freedom, freedom of choice. That tomorrow when I want to build an engine, I should be able to build any engine. Starting with 414, of course. And uh, technology absorption is uh, what is the next point which we need to uh, build in. So hope that explains why making jet engine is a, a different ball game altogether. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me come to another point then, sir. Um, how optimistic are you that this G deal could do the trick for us? I am optimistic, but a lot needs to be done for that. You know, what happens is if we sit back and say that, okay, you know, I was working hard to make something and someone just says that, okay, here it is for you. I'll give you. Now, it should not uh, instill a, a sense of, uh, you know, leisureness or laziness into me that, okay, something has come ready-made. Let me go slow on my effort. You have to become more aggressive. You know, earlier, I didn't have anything to look forward to. And now, I have a technology partner who's ready to part with the technology. I mean, who's ready to teach me how to do things. Now it depends how aggressive I am. When I say aggressive, means I, we need to put together our complete talent. I don't know, you know, unfortunately in our IITs or somewhere when you see the mainstream engineering is taking a backseat. You know, people are preferring the soft skill engineering disciplines more because probably there's more market for them. But your mechanical engineering, your, you know, like simple electric electrical engineering etc are are little uh, less preferred choices now but there are people doing it this will bring in a market for that you know when we know that we are going to be making engines in india okay then probably these disciplines will get a boost and we need bright young minds you know from these iits or wherever the uh, wherever they are to give them a task that here, uh, you know, is uh, tomorrow when a factory is set up or, you know, some MROs are set up or uh, when the engines start getting up. No, we are not going to provide only labor force to G that, you know, labor is cheap in India. So here are our people who will uh, do the labor for you. No, I mean, you know, we have to learn the recipe. We are not only going to, uh, you know, the make uh, uh, sort of cut vegetables for the chef. You know, we have to learn how to make the dish. So these people will have to observe very keenly, will have to interact with these engineers. Lot comes with talking, you know, that is why uh, it is important uh, that interactions are uh, set up. You know, 80% is what is being talked about. Now it is yet an MOU signed between G and HL. The details will come out when the detailed contract is signed that what exactly uh, is coming. Uh, but I would say there is a lot of scope, you know, let it, let's let start with this 80%, absorb it completely and along the way, uh, learn it, learn it, uh, uh, how to make and uh, implement it into our other uh, programs. It should not happen now, 414 is coming. So we say, okay, uh, let uh, again Kaveri go back to uh, back burner and we'll only make 414. So that should not be lost sight of because that is your product. 
that is what you are proud of and that is what uh, needs to come up and i'm sure we will definitely make some progress in that come to the end of this conversation uh, i have two last questions sir one is how is our preparedness you began this conversation by saying for most of our lives we've been pakistan focused we've been westward you know our gaze has been westward today of course we are in this entire competition with china uh, you know part of the reason this us deal has happened is because america exp expects us to be the bulwark in asia against china and so on and so forth how would you compare our preparedness with china that's my first question and my last question is if you think about all the ties the history of ties that we have in military defense uh, with russia do you feel that today slowly you know this is going to get phased out as we look westwards maybe towards france the us and other countries for our future needs that the russia story is coming to an end no so you have two questions let me answer your second question first okay all right the you know as far as the russia story is concerned russia has been a reliable partner okay and we we know even diplomatically we have taken care even in this recent conflict uh, to you know be responsible while we make statements on uh, these aggressions because russia was hold, has held your hand you know when you needed it uh, most but at the same time the wars or the defense preparedness does not run on emotions it runs on capability okay so india has all the right to uh, progress and to make itself the world class uh, force because ultimately when it comes to defending yourself you are going to be uh, on your own okay and uh, this kind of nato support what we see in ukraine etc such kind of support may not be available for india okay so if india has to prepare itself uh, militarily then it has to look everywhere wherever the technology can come from it's fair enough only thing it has to guard its interest be very careful when it uh, trusts people with uh, something not take it on the face value uh, all those i am sure aspects will be taken care of the people who are responsible uh, for that but what happens is nothing in my opinion should be uh, discounted or discarded you know everything remains an option and everything must be kept open as an option you know you never put all your eggs in one basket we have uh, learned that that you will we'll have problem okay earlier stories were different maybe not so much technology was uh, coming in there were uh, there was trust deficit or there was capability deficit you know even when people uh, transfer technology to you they want to see that will you be able to hold it you know are you not going to go rogue i mean will it not be transferred illegally Uh, to someone else etc etc okay so uh, having overcome that kind of facility now we are open to uh, talking to be you know usa russia france uk uh, whichever country israel i mean you know wherever it can come from uh, <clears throat> we single aim single focus that after few years or whatever is my prospective planning as per that my capability needs to come up to that so my relations or our india's relations need to be driven by capability by certain by the capability road map not by how you are going to deal with uh, nations i mean there is a famous saying in strategy that there are no permanent friends and no permanent enemies there are only permanent interests and people have shown it time and uh, again okay so i think we need to be live uh, to that and we have decent uh, uh, standing now that we are not apologetic about our you know choices uh, anymore and the world understands it now you will see for mk aircraft which is coming up even when the ge deal has been uh, uh, struck people are still hopeful why is safran still pitching for mk and says okay i will give you even more technology the other day there was a news that safran is ready to transfer 100% technology uh, for mk okay rolls royce also must be pitching in why because they are hopeful that it is not that india has fallen into lap of ge and now will not look anywhere else because if that was the case they wouldn't even be talking about it 
Okay. So tomorrow, if there is a potent technology coming from anywhere, so it will be welcome. So we don't discount Russia altogether. All I would say is that it has become now uh, another choice along with so many other choices uh, available to us. Okay. Coming to preparedness against, sorry, you have anything else to uh, say on this? Saying, and yes. And therefore, my last question now is yeah, uh, yeah. preparedness against China, against China. Uh, because okay. this seems to be, you know, a critical thing. That, you know, not just for today, but our future security challenges seem to all almost overwhelmingly come from China. Yes, you know that that's a when you talk of you know pure numbers. I mean, people start talking of numbers. There is no match. You know, they will have many more aircraft because they have their that uh, uh, you know aviation um, corporation going. You know, for quite some time, seventies it was uh, set up. And it has produced reverse engineered most of the Russian aircraft, you know, into all those MiGs have been replaced by J's and they have come up to J20. Okay. Huge number of them are available with them. Huge armament arsenal, you know, uh, missiles we have talked about. There are cruise missiles available with them, etc., etc. Okay. But what happens is uh, technologically, if we say they a proven technology, but we say, you know, they... Uh, Nobody has done any exercises with them. Nobody, uh, they do exercise only with Pakistan, I suppose. So get a bit of international uh, experience. Nothing much comes out of Chinese uh, literature. I'm not at all undermining or, uh, you know, uh, playing down the capability. We need to be wary of that. You know, that, that will be the fatal mistake if we say, oh, they are not worth anything. After all, we are building our capability, keeping that in mind. But all I'm saying is that overall... Uh, capability, all aspects considered. Now it's very interesting. There is a since you brought up, there is a uh, uh, there is a uh, uh, organization, uh, World Directory of Modern Military Aircraft. Okay, if if you Google it, you know World Directory of Modern Military Aircraft. It uh, gives some numbers to different air forces. Where are they? Okay, index. It gives some index, and in which you know what all it uh, uh, takes into consideration. It takes into consideration overall strength, modernization, logistic support, your uh, attack and defense capability, your training capability, uh, etc., and gives it TVR rating, true value rating. Very surprisingly, true value rating of Indian Air Force is put higher than Chinese Air Force. Okay, just from this point of view, by this site. Okay. A uh, gap is there between USA is a, a figure 242 point something and India is 89 uh, something. You know, it's a one third gap of USA. But all these factors considered, it puts India ahead of uh, China for some reason. Okay. Not with Sterling. We have, you know, advantages in certain aspects which China does not have. Number of airfields, you know, at lower altitudes and huge number of them. If you talk of Tibetan plot, Plato, the, you know, they have basically three airfields. We have probably 20 of them, uh, you know, uh, which can launch attack. Okay. Aircraft wise, the fourth generation, 4.5 generation, we we have uh, many aircraft. If we, if we talk of uh, that area, which is to be defended against them. Okay. The uh, army centric or, you know, the way uh, India can support our army in those uh, uh, places. Tactics wise, uh, probably are much more uh, refined, you know, they will have problem in many aspects. I mean, we can get into detailed tactics, you know, they have open grounds at 14,000 feet, which are difficult to defend. They have, you know, uh, infrastructure wise, certain choke points, which can become problem. So all these things, you know, we uh, carefully crafted into our warfare. A Indian Air Force has uh, developed itself uh, to a large extent to create enough deterrence for China, okay? I mean, it may not be able to overcome China or run into China or, you know, create, uh, take over China or something like that. But I don't think that's our aspiration as of now, okay? But in the air, we have enough capability that China uh, will always continue to make calculation that can it take on Indian Air Force in the air without uh, having an embarrassing situation at the end of it. It will make that calculation and as long as that continues to hold that any air skirmish in the air will lead to embarrassment of China, you know, of its capability that it has uh, so proudly uh, claims that it has, it, it will continue to hold back. But the gap 
it's trying to build up and we are aware of that where we fall short like you know it was isr capability with these reapers coming up it will uh, provide a great potential and these border skirmishes when we come the uh, you know aircraft like this armed uh, reapers we are also building tapas tapas ghatak etc which may take some time but now with the mros being set up and some technology coming it will accelerate uh, that also and uh, uh, you know what happens is uh, we need more refuelers uh, in the air we need more evacs in the air all those are uh, planned so when they are when they come up overall scheme of things uh, if you see i would say that air force nothing to be i mean you know nothing to uh, project too uh, widely against china but it's decent to be reassured that uh, china will think twice probably uh, provoking in an air force up in the air if it was confident of doing that my litmus test is these last two uh, skirmishes which have taken place be it doklam or galwan or subsequent you know uh, uh, tawang area etc if it had a small inkling that it can have better in the air like you know it started with army probably thought that it has an edge over uh, army and it can do that if it had the similar feeling about air force it probably would have brought in an uh, air element and uh, you know which it did not so means it it, it is very of uh, in an air force uh, deterrence i say it uh, with tongue in cheek because it you have to keep at it you know so far we have been able to do that but if we don't uh, continuously build up our capability uh, in these critical aspects you know, which are support arms, okay, along with that, because so many refuels, so many Su-30s, air-to-air capable refuelers, but if you don't have sufficient refuelers, then what is that air-to-air -air capability uh, good for? So all these things need to come up, which will come up, and they are, uh, you know, they also can be immediately inducted. I mean, tomorrow, if there is a requirement, they can come up. Training is an issue, but uh, it can be quickly uh, built up. So I think overall, that is where we uh, stand. We have enough deterrence capability uh, against it. Very optimistic note, uh, sir. Thank you very much for giving us an extremely detailed uh, overview uh, of where we stand, what the US-India deal in defense really means, uh, when are we going to get the jet engines that we need? Are they going to be developed at home or just taken from America or elsewhere? And of course, critically, uh, defense, air defense preparedness against China. Thanks very much. Really enjoyed our conversation. Thanks, Thank Air Marshal, for joining me. Thank you, Hino. Thank you so much. Thank you for getting me over, and it was a pleasure. In fact, thank you very much.